let's start madam vice chairman the scope of this debate has been expanded to attack the national security act the problem of reconciling personal liberty with the security of the state has been a recurring problem which is faced in every democracy in every generation said democracy cannot survive if personal liberty is mutilated gripped and cut fine bad but democracy also cannot flourish if it gets stuck in the groves of changeless laws which lose resilience to meet challenges which are forced on the nation every democracy has tried to find an answer to this dilemma according to its own historical experiences its political developments and the nature of the challenges which confront the nation it is this dilemma to which abraham lincoln gave an expression when he faced a congress in order to justify his measures which he undertook to, to meet the forces of secession when he said must a government of necessity be too strong for the liberty of its citizens or too weak for its own existence it is this very sentiment to which expression was given by mr jawaharlal nehru when the defended the preventive detention bill in parliament in 1952 and i just quote what he said per for my part i cherish the freedom of the individual and i do not want that freedom to be restricted in the name of the state but if the safety of the state is at stake the freedom of certain individuals has to be curbed mr nehru also commented upon the experience of britain to which reference was made by the members and he said i must however point out that there is a vital difference between our country and that compact little island with country's old traditions of disciplined behavior by the citizens and above all the rule of law said so, as i have said every country every democracy in every generation has sought to reconcile this dilemma according to its own experience what happened in the united states in 1950 when the united states the self state bastion of personal liberty what it set up into anti communist hysteria and felt itself besieged by an imagined world wide revolution contacted by the communist parties it went in for a compromise with personal liberty and passed with the honorable members of this side would like to know what is known as the national security act 1950 take the experience of germany after the first great war germany adopted one of the finest constitutions which any democracy has ever adopted namely the weimar constitution but this constitution was misused by those to whom human freedom and personal liberty had been granted by this constitution in order to grab political power and those very people ultimately subverted 
and destroy this constitution. It was this historical experience with which was at the background when Federal Republic of Germany after the Second World War decided to adopt a new constitution. In the new constitution, the Federal Republic of Germany incorporated Article 18, which goes to the extent of saying that fundamental rights of a citizen are liable to be forfeited if they are abused by that particular citizen. I just read that article whoever abuses freedom of expression of opinion in particular, freedom of the press, freedom of teaching, freedom of association shall forfeited those basic rights pair. And lastly, take France in which the whole concept of freedom, liberty and equality took its birth in 1958 when France was on the verge of chaos and anarchy and when there was a challenge to the very security and existence of France, de Gaulle was brought back to power. France decided to adopt a new constitution and this new constitution incorporated Article 16 which conferred ultimate and unprecedented powers on the President to meet any challenge to the integrity of the territorial sovereignty of the country while moving this amendment to the Constitution the French Prime Minister said that democracy is inconsequential and anarchy of those who wield power by the will of the people do not at the same time also enjoy the authority corresponding to the responsibilities which they assume. I respectfully submit said that this is the basic problem. And what is the position in this country today? A democracy which carries within itself the seeds of poison which can produce a man like Vindravada, a democracy in which helpless passengers are dragged out of a bag and are shot down by the dead of night in the open fields, a democracy in which innocent men, women and children who to shelter like frightened lambs in a lonely farmhouse are doused with kerosene oil and burnt to ashes, a democracy in which a poor old widow waits for her son to return home, but that son does not return home because he is caught around the street corner and is stabbed to death by a few hooligans in the name of religion and community is there not a democracy which can do without this particular step. Stop, Mr. Vice Chairman. The price situation as it is today as far as the necessities of life of the common man are concerned can perhaps be termed in one word that it is a fraud on the common people and an abatement of that fraud is committed by the total inaction of the government and government policies to the price rise that is going on. The wholesale price index has gone up. I am not going to the details of everything. I take only some of the basic articles which the common man uses. And what does it indicate? The wholesale index has gone up from 171 to 185 within the period between March and October. 
in one year's time the consumer price index increased from 150 to 195 with 1982 as the base year and increase of 35 percent in just one year's time mr x was suggesting that if the DRS allowance of the government employees is checked, if the increase in the wages of the wage earners is checked, that could be a remedy for all the problems that we are facing. A 35 percent increase in a few months, he wants to cut down the wages of lakhs of wage earners better. If they are to suffer in any way, Will the government policy change and will that bring about a radical change in the price situation in the country? I totally differ. He is only projecting the cost of the manufacturers, businessmen and the industrialists. <coughs> and in the name of that, he is trying to protect them. And only in order to protect them, he is asking for taxing the government employees and other employees indirectly inciting the private sector to do likewise stop parachin. Srimoti Shushuma Swaraj was spoken about the prices in the super budget but what we find is that outside it is more the price of Mukdal has increased by 30 percent from 11 rupees to 14 or by 30 percent from 11 rupees to 14 or 15 rupees mustard oil price has increased by 55 percent groundnut oil by 35 percent the price of potato has gone up from 3 rupees madam vice chairman the scope of this debate has been expanded to attack the national security act the problem of reconciling personal liberty with the security of the state has been a recurring problem which is faced in every democracy in every generation. Said democracy cannot survive if personal liberty is mutilated, gripped and confined. But democracy also cannot flourish if it gets stuck in the groves of changeless laws which lose resilience to meet challenges which are forced on the nation. Every democracy has tried to find an answer to this dilemma according to its own historical experiences its political developments and the nature of the challenges which confront the nation. It is this dilemma to which Abraham Lincoln gave an expression when he faced a Congress in order to justify his measures which he undertook to meet the forces of secession. When he said, must a government of necessity be too strong for the liberty of its citizens or too weak for its own existence, it is this very sentiment to which expression was given by Mr. Jawaharlal Nehru when the defendant the preventive detention bill in parliament in 1952 and I just quote what he said there. For my part, I cherish the freedom of the individual and I do not want that freedom to be restricted in the name of the state but if the safety of the state is at stake. The freedom of certain individuals has to be curbed. Mr. Nehru also commented upon the experience of Britain to which reference was made by the members and he said, I must however point out that there is a vital 
difference between our country and that compact little island with country's old traditions of disciplined behavior by the citizens and above all the rule of law there said as i have said every country every democracy in every generation has sought to reconcile this dilemma according to its own experience what happened in the united states in 1950 when the united states the self state bastion of personal liberty what itself up into anti communist hysteria and felt itself besieged by an imagined world wide revolution contacted by the communist parties it went in for a compromise with personal liberty and passed with the honorable members of this side would like to know what is known as the national security act 1950 take the experience of germany after the first great war germany adopted one of the finest constitutions which any democracy has ever adopted namely the weimar constitution but this constitution was misused by those to whom human freedom and personal liberty had been granted by this constitution in order to grab political power and those very people ultimately subverted and destroyed this constitution it was this historical experience with which was at the background when federal republic of germany after the second world war decided to adopt a new constitution in the new constitution the federal republic of germany incorporated article 18 which goes to the extent of saying that fundamental rights of a citizen are liable to be forfeited if they are abused by that particular citizen I just read that article whoever abuses freedom of expression of opinion in particular freedom of the press freedom of teaching freedom of association shall forfeit those basic rights per and lastly take france in which the whole concept of freedom liberty and equality took its birth in 1958 when france was on the verge of chaos and anarchy and when there was a challenge to the very security and existence of france de gaulle was brought back to power france decided to adopt a new constitution and this new constitution incorporated article 16 which conferred ultimate and unprecedented powers on the president to meet any challenge to the integrity of the territorial sovereignty of the country while moving this amendment to the constitution the french prime minister said per democracy is in consequential and anarchy of those who wield power by the will of the people do not at the same time also enjoy the authority corresponding to the responsibilities which they assume i respectfully submit said that this is the basic problem and what is the position in this country today a democracy which carries within itself the seeds produce a man like vindravala a democracy in which helpless passengers are dragged out of a bag and are shot down 
by the date of night in the open fields, a democracy in which innocent men, women and children who to shelter like frightened lambs in a lonely farmhouse are doused with kerosene oil and burnt to ashes, a democracy in which a poor old widow waits for her son to return home, but that son does not return home because he is caught around the street corner and is stabbed to death by a few hooligans in the name of religion and community is there not a democracy which can do without this particular step. Stock 5 rupees and that of cotton from 5 to 9 rupees. I am not in a position to understand how Mr. Singh has said that the prices have been checked. This is the position within one month of assumption of office by the Chandrasekhar government. So how can he say that prices have been checked then he, the prices of cereals, pulses, vegetables, milk, fish, egg, etc. which constitute almost 50% of the daily necessities of life have gone up and there has been a 12% increase in the past one year and all this despite a bumper crop. The government publications and the government announcements also say that this is the second successive year in which we have got a bumper crop, but there is no impact of this bumper production on the market. Why is it so? Incidentally, the price of sugar has somewhat stabilized, but the sugar cane growers are not paid adequately. On the one hand, there is the general price rise and on the other, the growers are affected adversely every year. During the winter months, the prices come down, but this has not happened this year and there must be some explanation as to why this is so. There must be something basically wrong somewhere and it must be found out and it must be unearthed when the new government took over the Prime Minister at that time said that the economic crisis would be overcome but we do not find any positive step having been taken so far in this regard. Can there be an improvement by levying additional does not of customs and excise duties? There is a strong speculative thing going on in the country and the traders are speculating and they waiting for an increase in the prices in the manner they want without any check from the government side. Actually, the margins of poverty are going ahead with their schemes for looting the people last year. The railway fares and freight rates were increased although there was no gulf crisis at that time. We from our party, the left front, questioned the then government about the ensuring consequential effects on the economy, commodity prices of the increases in the fares and trade rates, we had one then that it would have a cascading effect on the general prices. We opposed the move of the national government and told them that steps must be taken to mop up resources, otherwise it is not by raising the administered prices that we are going to solve the problem if that is so and if the prices have been stabilized as has been claimed by Mr. Singh, then where is the necessity to increase the price of coal only the day before yesterday? It was announced that it would be increased by 15%. Stop parachin. Mr. Vice Chairman said the railway budget for 1989-90 throws a heavier and cruel 
Biden on the common man leading to further inflation. The 11% hike in the freight rate increase in the luggage rates and reclassification of low rated commodities would have a multiplying effect and would also lead to steep rise in prices per there is a record increase in the mobilization of revenues. It is on the order of rupees 800 crores. The budget is deeply soft in appearance, but in reality, it is deceiving the common man and it will only fuel inflation. Let me submit that there is a big difference between the direct and indirect taxes as far as the consumer is concerned. Suppose there is a rise in the passenger fears, the result will be the passengers will suffer, they may or may not travel, or they may travel sparingly. But if there is a rise in freight rates, all the commodities like steel are going to be affected, the cost of coal will rise, I may not buy cement or coal, but as a common man, I have to share this burden with all the users of those items. So, this is the type of socialism our government is preaching. Generally, a person is taxed according to this capacity, but indirectly, every citizen of this country is taxed through this budget indirectly. This budget is a short blow for a common man. This is not the short budget. This budget, in a way, will lead to inflation. It is going to tax every citizen of this country. It is an uncharitable budget. Railways in India have always been taken as a social obligation. It is the largest organization in Asia. But instead of discharging the social obligation, this ministry has given up this philosophy of social obligation in general. The economy of the country is also reflected in the railway budget. I can say that the dividend system in India is a British legacy. When the private companies were there, the British government wanted to have their own loan and dividend. The same system we are following there must be an end to this dividend system. It must be written of moreover. The union government must give some subsidy to the railways. That must be the policy of discharging social obligation. But this government is not following that in Britain itself, the railways were given 80 percent pounds in 1987-88 as public service as assistance better. I am told that a large proportion of our best graduates in engineering and technology go abroad each year for higher studies and research and possibly for employment there. I see no harm in their going abroad to advance their knowledge and to acquire new experience but the institutes of technology, I hope you will agree, are not a training ground for the export of our scientific talent to other countries. The graduates have a debt to pay to the society that has educated them. I expect our graduates to remain and work within their country faces the hardships that the society to which they belong faces and work for the reconstruction of our economic life. At the same time, it is also the duty of the government to see that a congenial atmosphere, especially in terms of proper conditions of service, is created for technical personnel to function creatively, creatively and derive satisfaction from that work through their arena questions in more affluent countries, but no country has become rich without the intensive work of its people for this development and expanding production. It is not enough for the institutes of technology to aim at high academic excellence, not for the students of the institutes to graduate with high socialistic record, both the institutes and their 
alumni must become an integral part of the social structure of our country. They must have a commitment to our society in the whole past. India stood in the vanguard of learning and made a mighty contribution to mathematics, mathematics astronomy, medicine, and surgery and other branches of knowledge. Now that we have come into our own, it is the duty of the present generation to recapture the pristine glory of the past pair. There are many problems of technological development in our country for the solution of which the Institute of Technology and our national laboratories cooperating with one another can render invaluable services. This can be done in the process development and technical know-how for fertilizer production metallurgical products, design and fabrication of manufacturing plants and equipment, electronic and radio energy. I am told that although large fertilizer complexes have been set up forth in the public and private sectors, may plants are working far below. Their related capacity affecting adversely the supply of much needed fertilizers for agricultural development. There are many technical problems associated with the low productivity of our fertilizer factories, the institutes of technology which have fast rate chemical energy engineering. Departments should pull their expertise to study the problem of fertilizer production and provide a comprehensive solution to the industry. Stop parachute. Sir, as I was standing just before launch, the other two main maladies to find with this legislation which we are discussing. One, as I said, is it has a very narrow application, and the second is it is. Superfluous, the Honorable Minister intervened to say that the clause four of this legislation covers foreigners who have contracted with South Africa. She said she would reply in her reply to the debate in the lunch, lunch time. I have had occasion to consult legal opinion. I reiterate that clause four of this bill, which we are considering, is about past deals with Indians. It does not deal with entry of foreigners. So, in its present form, this legislation says that any Indian having links with South Africa will be de denied having uh, denied government facilities for that legislation is not required is simple simple government statement was enough and there is no need of saying all countries practicing apartheid there is only one country in the world practicing apartheid the passport of indian citizens says valid for all countries except South Africa, a simple statement of the government was enough that any sportsman having links with South Africa will not get a facility. It was enough. This legislation is not required to for that. Secondly, when you say Indians practicing apartheid, that is again superfluous number. No, India Indian practice apartheid. In fact, I again say Indians are practicing apartheid in its worst form. The other Indians who are still practicing untouchability. The other Indian who lives in Dawi, that is a worse form apartheid, worse sin than racial discrimination. In my opinion, it is much more valid in our country. Mahatma Gandhi, who fought against <laughs> racial discrimination in South Africa fought equally, jealously, for the removal of untouchability, untouchability today in our enthusiasm to act the West. We are in a hurry to bend backwards and say that we are in a hurry to bend backwards and say that apartheid is bad, but we do not talk of our own social problems. The third point which I want to emphasize to the ministry is the facilities created the money spent by the government are still revolving around the cities. Delhi has not a lot of 
स्टेडियम ए लॉट ऑफ फैसिलिटीज द फर्स्ट मेजोरिटी ऑफ अवर कंट्री मेन कैन नॉट यूज दोस फैसिलिटीज दिस इज अनदर फॉर्म ऑफ एफर्ट हियर आफ्टर ऑल इट इज द हैज हु विल हैव द फैसिलिटीज द रियल सिटीजंस विल नेवर गेट एक्सेस टू द फैसिलिटीज एंड द मनी व्हिच द गवर्नमेंट स्पेंड्स टू क्रिएट दोस फैसिलिटीज स्टॉप देयर it has been felt that for <laughs> improved in culture manual is required for this purpose a very big factory has been established at sindri it produced fertilizers when the factory started production a little over years ago some difficulty was felt in the initial stages in disposing of its produce our agriculturists have now understood the value of the fertilizer today there is such a big demand for this product that we are going to have at least two or three big factories in the country in the near future well, i told you that our railways suffered terribly terribly during the war period we had therefore to import a large number of engines and wagons during the last few years not only have the railways been completely rehabilitated but we have started manufacturing most of the things which we previously imported from abroad we have now factories which produce engines and wagons for the broad gauge as well as the meter gauge lines it is hoped that in the near future we will become completely self sufficient in this lines why become why all of this has been achieved we have also been able to day and open new railway lines there so you can understand that we have been all round pro- progress our position in the outside world has also improved very largely we did not have a single representative in a foreign country before 1947 india has supposed to be and was in fact a part of the british empire and as such had no independent existence of its own in the eyes of other countries since 1947 we have not on the our ambassadors all over the world and the ambassadors of other countries in delhi but our advanced is shot by many countries i do not know of any other country which within a period of 7 years has been from a dependent status to such eyes in international matters the foreigners who come and visit this country and go round and see things for themselves are full of praise for us tell more than that the policy of peace that our prime minister has been following has been appreciated and approved by all countries he has been telling the world that there is no way out of conflict except the that way which mahatma gandhi taught us what settles no question it creates new problems what may many problem do not understand is that preparation for what can happen in what when the first world war was fought it was proclaimed that it was a war to a war stop parachute the airport with a view to a augment our resources we have to produce more for exports and for that our products have to be more competitive in the international market in terms of quality and quantity even for domestic consumption the quality needs to be upgraded therefore we have to import certain things we have to import machinery and other things which are bulk imports take for example a edible oils fortunately this year the credit goes to the farmers that because of oil seeds production edible oils import is coming down but otherwise sometimes we are compelled to import edible oils petroleum and other things that is because of our domestic necessities at the same time you would agree that once we reach a stage where our industrialization and our production on the industrial front reach a particular level then 
इंटरनेशनल मार्केट विद इन आवर रीच आवर प्रोडक्ट आवर कमोडिटीज आर शोल्ड आउट these are the long term strategies of any country which has to stand on its own legs which has to maintain its own economy and it has to have a very conspicuous and a very prominent place in the international market we know the examples of korea of or japan and even smaller countries and what they did today they are strong because the real exports are more we have to augment our exports by giving traffic so daily by other incentives like cash subsidies or by tax exemptions and all sorts of incentives those incentives are needed so that exports can go up to each our bop situation it is not <coughs> proper to say that our imports are prodigal or that our imports are fitted it is not a correct pro- proposition there might be a few cases of aberration as mr x pointed out as the finance minister stated yesterday we will certainly try to contain unnecessary imports so that we import only to meet our immediate needs and requirements where we feel that even under ogl some particular commodities are not needed this would be stop and this could be canalized ready start i think it is very appropriate that the gandhi peace foundation has arranged to hold this seminar at this time on democracy and non violence so we are all aware of the malaise which seems to have overtaken our young and vigorous democracy through the increasing which our people take to violent methods for the redress of grievances real of imaginary it would certainly not do to neglect this malice we have to study it with care analyze the causes and find out the remedies this is thus a matter of study and research by institutions like the gandhi peace foundation let us admit that we have not yet laid the firm and unshakable foundation of our democracy for not build the stable institutions to which our people can grow fully into the democracy way of life i do not wish however to say some deep don't pull about the future but the must stress that the future will depend entirely on what we do in the present we cannot prescribe the current current sense for our democracy without taking stock of its errors the major error in the present situation in our country is the adoption of violent methods in most of our education big and small this might well indicate a possible erosion of our democracy from within parity i wonder why we are not on farmer ground both in our democracy and in our non violence in this country where mahatma gandhi did work and thought can be forget except at our period that gandhi ji brought up us to the first years of our freedom through his movements which were basically non violent it will always remain to the credit of our great leader that even as he took us step by step to independence he also trained us at the same time in the duties and responsibilities of democrat democratic and non violent citizenship freedom real accrued to us as the result of many long years of self discipline which we cultivated and if the that freedom has stood many hard tests in our life and in this large because of those disciplines have held in so far as gandhi ji depended on non violent methods of the education of the people the security and an unified of india consent and above all the training of the masses not to give away to anger and hate he also laid the foundations of a peaceful democracy but we have in recent times strayed a great deal from his path and indulged in a reaction of forcefulness and disloyalty struck directly today 
when we are discussing a appropriation bill, I would like to draw the attention of the Honourable Minister about one important thing that is going on. Outside Parliament House, almost all the junior doctors in the capital are observing a protest day to day. You know there was an agreement between the health ministry and the organization of the junior doctors which was signed in November 1986. So far the government has not taken any action to implement that agreement. That is a very unfortunate thing. The doctors are very much demoralized because of its non-implementation and the indifferent attitude of the government. They are now observing a protest today. I think that are going in for another general strike in the near future. So what I have to say on this occasion is that the government should see that once an agreement is signed, it is implemented, so let, let them back make amends on that. That is the first request I have to make there. Yesterday I was listening to the speech made by the Honourable Finance Minister. He spoke about many things, but unfortunately he did not mention about the problem of price. The problem of price means is it possible to stabilize the price? Can we bring about stability in the price sphere in the coming future? This is a very big decision that is looming large in the minds of the poor people in the country after reading the budget and after going through the supplementary budget etc. My impression is that there are chances for increase in prices unless we pay serious attention to this problem. It will become difficult and affect the common people very much. That is how I find it. If you go to the market and inquire, you can see that the prices are going up every week. We can see in the newspapers who also did. The main reason for the price hike is the policies that are pursued by this government. I do not want to go into the details because those things have been debated in the general budget and I do not want to repeat them. What can we do in this situation? According to me, the government should pay adequate attention to improve the public distribution system. If you do not have any nationwide plan to improve the public distribution system, the prices will go up very high and the common people are going to be hit very hard. When I raise this question, I have something in my mind. Stop parroting. The relationship between national integration and social economic development is also equally closed and in fact as mutually interdependent as the chicken and the egg. National inter integration which is needed for the very survival of a nation is a precondition for development because India must live before India can grow at the same time. How can feelings of national integration survive for long in a situation? A great poverty where nearly half of the inter production lives below the poverty line and where there are large disciplines in income between one social group and another. We must therefore uh, sir, uh, therefore strive our best to abolish at least the colossal forms of poverty and to create a much greater equality of opportunity. We have on the one hand the employees under the government in the organized industry and in the public sector corporations with those whose incomes and perquisites are well above the general economic level of the population. On the other hand, we have large masses of very poor people living in the urban slums, small and marginal farmers and landless agricultural laborers in rural areas who are unemployed or unemployed, whose incomes are very low and who cannot even look forward to two square meals a day. For most of the year, I know this from personal experience because I have lived for the last six years in rural areas and work as a farmer. How can we hope to have a cohesion society or national integration in a background of such clearing socio-economic inequality? 
liberties and injustices we must be able to strive to bring about rapid social economic development with social justice this will create a healthy and hopeful atmosphere in the country and reduce the inevitable consequences which extend disparities generate greater and more rapid social economic development will you follow it is this golden cycle we must try to establish better the creation of conditions in which every citizen may be effectively involved in the administrative process is yet another aspect of national integration we must endeavor to reorient the administ- administration so that the services are de- <coughs> demoralized and made more uh, responsive to the needs and aspirations of the common man it is also necessary to ensure that the common man is assured justice and fair play in all matters which affect his daily life even more important are the reforms which will decentralize authority and enable the common man to play an effective role in national development this will need a considerable devolution of authority from the center to the states within the constitutional framework and without in any way enlarging the fundamental unity of the country's structure. It is a very good budget and it is an important step which would help remove poverty and provide employment. The budget contains a significant provision for providing employment to at least one member of each family which is really commendable and the minister des- deserves to be in- congratulated. Therefore, the budget contains a provision for 500 crores of rupees for financing an important scheme known as Jawaharlal Nehru. Every employment scheme, we shall have to take necessary measures to ensure that the benefit of the scheme partly to the deserving people. It has been in my experience that we make huge allocations here, but their benefit does not reach the people for whom those allocations are made to the officers who are to carry the benefit to the deserving people, grab heavy grounds and fill their own pockets instead. Hence, the government must see to it that the benefit of the proposed schemes reaches the people for whom it has been prepared and the funds are utilized for that purpose alone. The Prime Minister, Mr. X, has laid special stress on the welfare of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. No satisfactory arrangements have so far been made to provide the education facilities to those advised. Adivasis and Horizons who are inhabited in far flung forest areas. Whenever I visit their villages, those people tell me that they need a school in the village and also a clear clear great by open in every village. But the state of affairs is such that if a teacher is posted in a village school, he instead of working in the school. A village gets posted in a village school. He, instead of working in a school village, gets himself transferred to a city with the convenience of officials. It has also been noticed on some officials that a teacher appointed to a school village does not join there at all and draws his salary from for months together without any work. His officers also connive at it. This should not be allowed to happen. It causes a lot of harm to the interest of the children of the village concerned. I demand that there must be at least one school in each village. At present, we do not have one school even for four to five villages. I wish that in the next two, three years, at least one school be opened in each village. Apart from a school, there must be one adult education center in each village. The present adult education program is not adequate because 10 to 12 or at least 25 to 30 such centers have been opened in every tyson. This number is not at all sufficient. Stop, we realize 
that the success of otherwise of such internationally elite projects in the end will be measured by the indigenous capacity built up in the process to replace the donated commodities with the country's own indigenous production sooner than later. Every country thus has to evolve strategies such suited to its own genius in this context the question of improving the availability of glass and glass and water for our cattle cannot be overlooked. This is of crucial importance for the welfare of our livestock and I am sure our scientists would devote more attention to this matter. We should also be increasing attention to evolving strains of cattle which are genetically in harmony with our climate and environment and to the production of vaccines which prevent spread of diseases among farm animals per in rural India, animal production provides additional employment to some millions of small farmers. For example, income from two buffaloes can enable a landless widow to look after himself and her family. We are therefore not thinking of encouraging large herds concentrated in the hands of specialized dairy farmers. Our social objective as far as possible is equal to distribute rural incomes by a provision of year-round productive employment to our agricultural labor force well. Why the solutions of one country may not suit the needs of another, we can all say certainly learn from one another's experience. I am sure that our dairymen attending this Congress will learn much from the international community of dairy scientists and practitioners gathered gather here today. And I hope that our international visitors will find India's dairy experience a refreshing adventure in situations now new to them. Better. In this context, I must say how gratifying it is to see more delegates from the developing countries here than at any previous Congress. I hope that India's approach to dairy development will be a particular interest to them. In fact, I would go hard that we have received much help from overseas in building up our recent dairy industry and now we have institutions for dairy research, education and training as well as a modest number of successful dairy projects. It would be most fitting if these dairy institutions of ours were to throw other countries which can make use of them in building up their own dairy industry. I understand that our National Dairy Development Board is already in contact with other countries. I hope that such contacts will mul multiply so that India may try to give back in full measure the help which it has received from the international community for its own dairy development. Stop the Sir, without going into details, I have to remind this house in India has a proud record for of fight, fighting. Apartheid, we were the first country to impose sanctions in 1947 when Jolan was the Prime Minister of the Interim Government at a press conference in September 1946. He had announced the sanctions. It was not after independence, but the Interim Government took this decision. It was an expression of the policy which was involved during the course of our freedom struggle, a policy which highlights a strong link between Asia and Africa. At that time, we had a trade of rupees 119 million with South Africa, it uh, amounted to almost 6% of our exports. We recall our High Commission in 1946. We closed our research in 1954. It is all a matter of record. We were again the first country uh, to raise this issue in the United Nations General Assembly. Our efforts have succeeded in sponsored a resolution in the United Nations in 19. 62, along with 34 other 
countries, it finally led to the exclusion of South Africa. We have taken initiative in the Commonwealth today, among with other members of the non-allied movement and the Commonwealth countries, we are working in a resolute manner for the enforcement of comprehensive sanctions which are in fact being opposed by certain countries who, by their support, continue to provide sustenance to the racist regime. On the other hand, my honorable friend says that we are happy the West. I am quite surprised because the Western countries are providing them with support and sustenance. The United States of America and the United Kingdom have both refused to impose mandatory sanctions. What we are doing is entirely in conformity with our policies and views. It is a consistent approach and not an ad hoc approach well said. When we talk of abiding in sports here, again we have to realize that sports are governed by a moral code where there need not be and should not be any room for any discrimination. This is what the Olympic Charter says in the Abnormal society, no normal sports is possible. The people who are denied opportunities elsewhere in the air or in the life are also denied equal opportunities in sports that had st started way back in 1948. There were separate white clubs, white sports bodies which obtained affiliation with the international bodies and completely excluded non-Europeans. The majority of people who otherwise are not only poor and undernourished but are also denied access to the facilities. Stop. Madam, I would suggest to the Honorable Delay Minister that he should have a map before him before preparing his budget, one does not know which state has got how much debt there will be a complete survey in regard to each state, in regard to the length of a railway line, extent of gauge, gauge conversion, the funds invested on gauge conversion, how many new lines have been laid, the number of new services, the additional facilities given the funds allocated to each state, etc. Let the Honorable Minister give the completely quality figures, otherwise it is the fruits for us to say all these things in the other house. The Minister did not reply to any of the objections raised. There was a strong protest. My Honorable friend called it a beautiful budget. I do not know in what way it is beautiful members in the other house cutting across the party lines, including Congress, I, MPS strongly protested against the railway minister, Madam, that injustice has been, really, has been done in point of, Madam, you are also sympathetic coming from Bombay. Is there any trade or its name which runs faster in point of? I am not going to compare India. Indian railway speed and efficiency with that of France or, or Japan or the Soviet Union. But to go to Bombay from Bangalore, you have to go to Miraj first, which takes 20 hours, and then you have to change over at Miraj to broad gauge. In fact, I do not know in whose tenure the broad gauge line was laid from Bombay up to Miraj, but our from Miraj no gauge conversion has taken place there where there was a survey thanks to the former minister, Mr. Jafar Sen. He ordered the survey in regard to conversion of this very important line, more Miraj to Bangalore, but <coughs> surprisingly, in reply to a question by Mr. Honuman Thappa, the Honorable Minister has said that there will be a reappraisal of the subject. I do not know what it means, Mr. Jocularly, in the other house, if there is a will, there is a railway. If there is no will, there is a this is the position here. If you do not want to give a new railway line, have a survey, though the survey has been completed for the conversion into broad gauge of the line between Miraj and Bangalore. It is in cold storage. Now a survey has been ordered in respect of the Bangalore Udupi line. Thank you. Jai Jai Ramad.